Ευχαριστώ. Συνεχίζουμε όμως στο τρίτο και τελευταίο μέρος ε, του Wired Greece με τον Robert Stulle. He has worked in the digital communication since 1995, since 2009 as a partner at Ed Spiekeman in Berlin. With two decades of professional experience as a designer and consultant, Robert is the head of digital products and services and at Ed Spiekeman. Robert? Hello, good evening. Taking a picture of you. Yes. And maybe just a little, yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> And I have to set the timer. There's a timer on here that I can use to see the time. Um, and I'll put it right here. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to be here tonight. I'm very happy to be in Greece. It's my very first time in Greece, and um, it's wonderful. We had a fantastic evening in Thessaloniki yesterday with Aris. Thank you, Aris, for showing us around. We spent a nice evening in the olive oil district, I think it's called. It's very nice. <laughs> and thank you, Ephthemios and Athena and Betty for making this fantastic day happen. It's really cool. Happy to be here. So this went to, oops, no, I don't go back. Um, my name is Robert Stulle. Um, I am the partner and uh, a partner and co-owner of Eden Spiekermann in Berlin. And I was trained as a visual, um, in visual communications, so that makes me a designer. Um, how many of you are designers? Okay. UX people? Coders? Ooh, developers in the house. Very good. People of the writing trade? A few, very good. Photographers? Awesome. Very cool. So today we are going to talk about um, designing for joy. Um, uh, yes. Who is Aiden Spiekermann? I want to give you a little bit of a background of who we are as an agency and where I come from. So you know what, um, where I'm coming from um, in my talk. <laughs> we are about 100 people um, across several um, uh, offices that we have. I come from the Berlin office, which is the biggest Then there's Amsterdam, a small office in San Francisco, small office in Stuttgart, and a very small, just newly opened office in Singapore. And as you can see, we are, um, have a big variety of different people. It's about 50-50 men and women from all sorts of backgrounds. And we have about 15 nationalities amongst us. And now you wonder, is there a Greek boy or girl in it? Yes, there is. Look, that's Spiros, our Greek colleague. This is how it looks in the office. Um, now we have cleaned up on that day, but this is how it could look. And if you think about um, uh, design offices, you think about the tools that are used there. And of course, we come from a background of corporate design, and as designers, we use InDesign and Photoshop and Sketch and Keynote and PowerPoint. But the most important tools that we use nowadays are these. This is our, the tech stack that we handle at Eden Spiekermann. And working with technology has become an integral part of what we do and how we work as designers. Because coders are also designers. They design in code, they create in code. And we use uh, methods where we work, work very closely with design and code together in an agile way. Of course, there's always um, uh, cutting and pasting. Um, that will never go away. And this is just the, the The, the tool set with which we operate. We have tried to encompass what we do in one sentence so we can explain it to our clients. And it looks like this. We design meaningful, smart and seductive brand experiences so that your customers become your followers. I think creating experiences is what all our projects are about and about making that connection between a brand or a product or a service with the end user or with the consumer. We do that um, um, around a, a broad range of different um, projects. 
as you see some examples here. It's from service design top left. We'll see more about this. Apps, packaging systems, identities, digital tools. It's a very wide range. So let me tell you what we do not do anymore. We don't do that anymore, the waterfall method, where you start in the beginning with a concept, and then comes the designer and designs, and then goes, it goes over to the technical people who have to do the technical implementation, which is a wrong word in itself altogether. And then at the end, you pour in the content, and that does not work. We have done it all before in the early 2000s, and now we know this is a broken process. Projects break here, especially <laughs> when the, the wrong font is <laughs> applied. <laughs> and they break again over here and everywhere in between. And even if it was a perfect waterfall project and the very first guy had the best concept and the best design, then in the end, would come up, what would come out at the end of the line could never be better or bigger than what the first person had in mind. In this process, you miss all of the opportunity to learn of the mistakes and to adopt and to look at what you have done, inspect what you have done and adopt. Hence this agile idea to inspect and adopt. So what do we do instead of that? We work with agile methods and we combine the design aspects, the content aspects and the technology at the same time in an iterative process where we work in sprints and always look at what we have gotten. And this is the beauty of um, when you work on it, you work on the real product. There is no lorem ipsum, there is real data, there is no throwaway um, mock-ups and um, Photoshop simulations because you work on the real thing from the get-go. It becomes the beta and then the first release and so on. We strongly believe that if we combine technology and design and content and add research to the mix, then we can create what we strive for. We can create something of relevance. So relevance is what we want to do. And here are some pictures. So what does it come down to? What are the actual products that we produce? It's websites like this one for Red Bull, or that one, also Red Bull, or this one where we um, made a new e-commerce environment where you can buy beautiful typefaces, fun shop, or this one that was about a reading experience where you can read books on your iPad. Or this one about a more business client um, that is about email marketing. And the very latest that we released was this one, a website about cooking. This is like the Jamie Oliver of Switzerland is called Annemarie Wildeisen, and this is her new website. And if you think that cooking is easy, I can tell you content modeling for this project was super sophisticated and extremely taxing. Um, we are um, also what I want to mention today is that we will start um, with a new client with, that I'm very excited about called Birth in Archives, and they are about Buddhism and they collect wisdom about Buddhism, and we will work together with them to bring Buddhism to the 21st century. This is a project that I am looking out for to start with. Okay, what else do we do? We do apps like this one. We do a lot of user interface design um, uh, uh, simulations. There I say it, yes. <laughs> um, and we work um, for TVs, TV apps, smart TVs, set-top boxes. And of course, there's still branding. That's a very important aspect of our work. And in the brand development, we have also adopted a much leaner way to do it. We do that with startups mostly because it's highly compatible. Um, where we really create the brand as the new, with the requirements that when the new brand hits the new market, you develop that what you need at that time, and not the big fat toolbox to begin with, but step by step. We call it lean uh, brand development, and this is an example for a startup called Get Your Guide, and this is another thing that I just showed a little bit of, called Bloon. There you see how this lean brand process, um, what it produces. Also, there is still the good old big brand development, like here for a client called Otto Bock. They are world market leader in orthotics and prosthetics and wheelchairs. And we work with them to bring their brand to all of the different touch points, you know, from print to digital um, sales tools to online communication, internal, external communication, um, up until um, packaging projects. So this is like 
the good old big brand development. What else do we do? We um, are heavily into digital editorial. We love that. We released a big brand um, in Germany, um, Zeit Magazine Online. Um, that was a, a big thing for us. <laughs> and we also have some other um, publishers in Switzerland, noticeably, which with, with which we work to bring digital editorial products to the market. And in these projects, it's not only about technology and design, it's also a lot about talking with the editorial team what the future of journalism really is. How do we consume journalism um, in this 21st century where we think that everything that is online should be for free? These are interesting projects. And we do campaigns, design research, workshops and trainings. Yes, and service design. And this project will come back later again. Um, this is a beautiful project that our Dutch colleagues did um, where we created a dynamic signing uh, system where you have a display that shows the train. You know, when you have to find your way into the train, you usually have a little thing and then the train is like this big or you have a big um, poster, the train is about like this big, and this is as big as the real train. It's an LED display above the train, I'll tell you more about it. And we won a lot of awards for it, which we are very happy f um, with, for. And we even met the Dutch royal couple, so look at that. This is Her Majesty the Queen of the Netherlands, Maxima. Oh, that's me. That was a great moment in my professional life. Okay, this is how it looks in our office. As I said, we are designers and techies. We create strong brand experiences, and we also want internally to have a culture where everyone in our company can further grow and develop, not only in a professional sense, but also in a personal sense. So we have all sorts of programs, which maybe we can talk later about to ensure that everyone um, grows in their daily life. This is what we're all about. So, how do we work? I want to um, give you an idea of what our approach is, because I think it's different from a lot of approaches that other companies do, and it's something that um, has crystallized over the past four or five years within our company. So normally, you would say um, a design project works like this. There's a client, the client has a briefing, and he says, I need this, this, and this. Can you do it for me? It should be green, because I like green. Um, and then we continue to work. And then we start to work with the briefing. And we say, OK, let's make A, B, and C different um, design examples. And we give them, we present them, and then you choose A, B, or C. And then we start producing. But this is not at all how we work at Eden Spiekermann. There, we always start at that table. And this table is in our, we have a beautiful big um, uh, conference room on top of our office, and we sit around this table, and then we put some fruit on the table, because that's full of vitamins. And then we talk about the meaning and the purpose and the content. So what is this project about? Why do you want to do this project? It's just what you said also, ask why several times. It gets pretty painful if you ask several times. We need to have a microsite for the new project product. Why? Because we want to sell the new product. Why? You know, if you continue like this, it gets painful but highly interesting. Um, in these meetings, um, we talk with the whole team. Not only our whole team, but also from the client side, the whole team. And that delivers very um, interesting situations because um, if there are different people from the client side, from different um, departments, then they might hear each other talk for the first time about the project. There's the product guy, there's the editorial guy, there's their CEO or a financial dude, and they have never talked before about this project. Yeah, relaunch, make a microsite, blah, blah. Because everyone has an idea, but they haven't exchanged it yet. And in these um, meetings, we talk about that. And of course, we do it highly user-centric. So we work with personas, as you have heard about before um, today. And um, when we have the personas on the wall, there is one person that we love to have in the room. Whenever we can get this person in the room, it's very beneficial to get the CEO. So if you work with your client, try to get the highest-ranking 
person in the office that you can probably get, and it will be a very good afternoon. A method that we apply in these um, sessions is something that we call the product vision board, which is an existing method, but we adopted it slightly. Where you see on top are the personas, and we created them either by ourselves or based on research or with the client. And then in the combined session with all of our team and all of the client, we say, okay, what are these users' needs? What do we know? What do we expect? What do we think? And then what features do we implement to accommodate these needs? And then, what value do we get from that? So it's need, feature, value, and if you put your wall full of that, then you have a very good understanding of what your project really is about, because it's never about the amount of green, or never about a certain technology. At that stage, we don't talk about design. We don't talk about color, we don't talk about images or illustration style, we don't talk about technology. We only talk about content, meaning, and purpose. And that works very well with um, startup people because they love it. And it also works very well with other people, more of the more corporate um, side. Like these people in the bank, you see, they love it as well. And let me tell, me, let me tell you about this guy. This was the, um, is the um, head of marketing of Funshop International. And he spent, um, I think, more time on this couch in our office than in his own office when we worked on the website um, funshop.com because he was very close to the team and he had a role to fulfill, the role of product owner. So he had to work with us and with the team and be there and see everyone and know everyone and work with them. And that was the team. The um, Red Bull Music Academy? No, no, doesn't matter. <laughs> Amapico is, um, they, talk, they took the concept of the Music Academy and applied it to social entrepreneurs in Africa. So in the Music Academy, musicians get paired with music masters, musicians, sound people to um, grow their, their, their musical understanding. Here, social entrepreneurs get paired with, um, with writers, with designers, with photographers, so they learn to tell their story to the world. And here we send our um, creative director, Paul Woods, with the, in the middle, <laughs> um, to, to Africa, and he worked there with the people in a, a three-day academy, um, bringing their stories um, in a web format, in a beautiful, digital long read format. So all these entrepreneurs were able to tell their story and were able to reach an audience. And because we had to do it in a very short amount of time, we had to create some tools to set it up to prepare for it. And we created a tool that we call the Story Builder, which is like a mini CMS that you can use and then in a very easy and modular fashion, you can set your, you can tell your story. And it um, produces very beautiful fully responsive long read. And this is how these pages then look like. And here are just some uh, impressions from how it was in the end. Now we're in the next phase of Amapico, that we will um, um, uh, develop it further into a full platform where people can do much more than only tell their story, but also find followers, find people who help them with it, find certain skills, and other people can follow projects and can also donate and follow how the project develops. And um, some of these projects got highly recognized when Bill, uh, Bill Gates tweeted out um, about one of these projects. Um, uh, of course, that went through the roof. And before you know it, you have a big story, and that story is then everywhere. So how do we do it with uh, um, Amapico? What's, what do we need to create something like this? We need an awesome team, so we put together an awesome team. And in this case, it's a super international team of Italy, Germany, USA, again, Germany and Greece. Spears. <laughs> And not only are these um, uh, 
people that are very good in their trade, but they're also uh, people that you love to work with. And that is a fantastic thing that we have in our office. Very um, fantastic and beautiful people. Here, uh, you see in the middle, they feature something um, on, on their back, a backpack, which is one of the stories that got just highlighted. Um, it's made from um, used material. It's one of the projects from the Amapico platform. And in the back, there is a solar panel. And the solar panel here, there's some other images, can then be reused and put on top of a jar. And then it serves as a light in the evening. Because a lot of people don't have electricity, so they can charge up during the day. The school kids, in the evening, they can use the lamp to do their homework. OK, so that, what does the team do? Um, they work, they look at the monitor, they judge everything what they do critically, and it looks like that. And their work environment is, of course, looking like this, or like that, or on the wall. And we created little magnets, and on the magnets are the portraits of the people working on it. And this is very helpful when we put it on the magnetic chalk walls, because then we can assign tasks to everyone with paper. And somehow this technique um, became a big thing in our office. You see, this is the wall, the, uh, a magnetic chalk, chalk board wall, where you can write on with chalk and have magnets on it. And if you look to the left, there's the team sitting. So left, this is how it looks like where the team is. And then for purely scientific reasons, there's also a television and a couch. And if the people don't work in the office, they work at home. I don't know. This was at home. Or they work at the airport or at Christmas parties. And when they don't work, they are on holidays <laughs> and make movies about it. And when they come back from holidays, they're back in the office and they work again. Uh, do you notice something, something strange about this image? No, me neither. Because this is perfectly cool. You have to goof out from, from time to time. It's important to have fun in your work. And if you need to design a hamburger menu, then sometimes you really just have to do a hamburger menu. So yeah, putting stuff on walls is pretty popular in the office. And we have white walls as well in the other <laughs> parts of the office, and they get used a lot. This is something that we find very useful, to have a wall, because it's the highest resolution, very tactile touchscreen setup that you can think of. And it's super easy to edit, and we love it. So other things that we find useful, let me share them with you. Um, we find it useful to start um, with talking about content, meaning, and purpose. And I already talked about it, why this is an important thing. And it is also to get a touch with the end user, as it has been mentioned before several times. I think that most products do not fail because they are technically broken. They just fail because nobody needs them. Because they came up with an idea, ah, oh, we need to do this, but really there's no one behind it that really needs it. And then we, th we have seen that it is important to be in service of content, the hero. And now I have to use the Batman metaphor again because I love it. And here it is. This is Batman. Who has played the game? Some people. Okay, not everyone who has seen the movie. Almost. Ah, perfect. So I think as a designer, we are in service of content, the hero. And if the hero content is Batman, and our purpose is to bring the content to where it needs to be active, to bring Batman to where it, he needs to be active. So what do we do? What do we create? Yes! We create the Batmobile. This is our job. This is what we do. We create the Batmobile for content. And it's very important to think about this because no one else, this is specifically made for Batman, for our content. You cannot put Superman in it. It would be ridiculous, or Spider-Man. <laughs> We make it purposefully for this piece of content that we want to get out. And it shares the same attributes as the content itself. It is awesome, powerful, over-the-top, kick-ass. It has to be the ideal tool to deliver the content, if you know what I mean. By the way, all of these um, Batmobiles through the years have been pretty awesome. And also, as a random fact, in, Sw in, in Sweden, Batman was called Lederlappen. 
We find it useful to treat contact content as the nut to crack. So for here example, uh, for example, here in this project that was about um, seamless air travel, it is important to see where am I, in what situation, do I still have time to go to the toilet or time to get something to eat. Um, and it is important to um, realize not only what you offer, but... on the platforms and in the stations and they saw what situations arose and why these situations came up and they observed patterns in behavior like group behavior patterns patterns the more people you get together the more stupid the this herd gets and they take strange decisions and all these um, methods of observing and being there create the input that you need and then an invaluable tool are co-creation workshops, where you take people from all sorts of stakeholders across your project together, and they talk about um, how they can imagine a solution, and they work in a playful way on the solution themselves. And then of, um, suddenly you have these situations where someone says, if we only could do this, and then another person said, yes, I think we can do it because I know something that you don't know yet. And this is um, how great value comes about and relevant stuff can be created. So let me show you in a very quick movie um, how the end result, final result, really looked like. And if Dutch television sound. Now I think that the En een van de oplossingen is om de trein al te kunnen laten zien voordat hij binnenkomt. Het idee was een heel groot ledscherm, wat door de hele lengte van het perron loopt. Waar je al vijf tot tien minuten van tevoren exact ziet waar de trein komt te staan. Waar de ingangen zijn, hoe druk het is in de verschillende coupés. De rode kleur geeft aan dat de coupé behoorlijk vol is. Uh, oranje iets ertussenin en groen betekent dat je vrije plekken hebt. En waar je bijvoorbeeld met de fiets naar binnen kan of met je rolstoel. En het gevolg is dat reizigers van tevoren al het juiste plekje gaan zoeken op het perron. En al precies weten waar de deur komt en welke coupé ze in willen stappen. Je ziet dat er van alle kanten, ook in het buitenland, mensen al op de hoogte zijn van het project. Omdat ze, ja, dit kan je inzetten op natuurlijk veel meer uh, zaken, ook bij metro's en dergelijke. This is Joost, our partner in Amsterdam. And the language you heard was Dutch. I love it. I can speak Dutch, by the way. Um, so another thing that is very useful is to question the early assumptions. And this has come up, I think you had mentioned it before. This is also super important. And we have a special process for it that looks like this. There's one guy thinking about something, another person trying something out, and then we always have someone who is quietly questioning early assumptions. And this is how you should do it as well. Because the early assumptions are uh, treacherous. <laughs> there is a, a saying in Germany, um, the problem and the solution are two sides of the same metal. Um, but often this is not the case. It's never the case. So on front there might be the problem, but on the back there's not the solution. On the back there is just something else. The solution might be somewhere completely different 
And it's very important to not go an easy way and say, okay, yeah, I know the problem and now I do this, but really question it. And to give you an example, we have created a lot of different solutions to this train problem. And we have brought them to a pretty, pretty far advanced prototyping stage. And then in the end, we have decided to take this solution that is the most effective, the most immediate, and the most fun, and the most sexy, which is this humongous LED display. So you all know a lot of our problems that we try to solve as information architects are um, brain problems. But in the end, we cannot only aim for the brain, we also absolutely have to aim for the heart because the final connection that you have with a product or a brand or a service, you make with your heart. It's an emotional thing. We need this guy and I cannot recommend it enough. Go for the heart. Which brings me to designing for joy. I think we can only be um, good at what we do and um, create value for our clients and create value for ourselves if we are able to create a, an atmosphere of transparency and trust. So for example, we don't put up facades. These four guys are, or four people are in our office right now and one of them is the client. Which one? It's not important. It's the guy with the gray t-shirt. <laughs> but this is just to illustrate that there is not a facade, there is not a room where here you have the nice meeting and then behind the facade there is all the people slaving away. But we invite our clients to work with us in our environment to be part of our culture, of our daily, li daily life. And then we have seen in so many examples that if you have clear direction and trust, you don't need a lot of spec documents. Sometimes it's just some chalk on the wall, which is enough to green light a certain thing and then move on. I think it is important in our trade that we create our own reality. And we all work on projects for clients with people and in an environment. And my personal goal with my work and what I do is to work on great projects for great clients with great people in a great environment or to work on fantastic projects for fantastic clients with fantastic people in a fantastic environment. Or to work on... Um, no, <laughs> not even trying to say that. <laughs> but this is what I think is so simple, but this is really, I think, um, where you can create joy for yourself and for your colleagues and for your clients and for the end users as well. So let's just call it kick-ass, cool, incredible, beautiful. As long as it is green, as it is positive, I'm okay with it. So if there's something bad appearing in this list, like boring projects, you can do that for a time. That's okay. Sometimes you have to. But don't keep going down the red road, go back up on the green road and get rid of that. And also, if there is something like with okay-ish people, that's okay for some time, but aim for to work with great people. So, get rid of the okay-ish people. It should all be green. This is my simple theory. Um, and I have another quote. You have to create your life, you have to carve it like a sculpture. And I think we can. We can create our own reality. And if you say, well, maybe my client um, does not allow me to do it, then you have to also challenge your client and look at how you work in your projects. And if we have a simple graph here where, for example, this dimension is the dimension of um, you learn something, where you can evolve yourself, you have something new, it's an interesting task, and then this would be the axis where you earn something, where you make some money. So on the left, there would be vertically, there would be um, the happiness, and on the bottom, there would be the money. I mean, <laughs> we don't have to fool ourselves. We won't get rich in this job, but we will not get rich in money, but we will get rich in experience and joy and happiness, and maybe enough money to have a really good life. But okay, I'm, uh, no, that's not what I wanted to say. Um, you know, you have, you, we all know these projects. You learn a lot, it's very interesting, but there's not a lot of money. 
it's an NGO or it's an artist that lives across the street or something like that. And you do it and it's great because you learn and you can develop your skills and you can develop, um, your, you can broaden your horizon. You should do that. This is absolutely important. And we all know these projects where you, you make some money and it's cool, but it's not very interesting. You don't learn a lot. And this is, these are the projects that are okay to have, but what the really interesting segment is, of course, top right corner, as almost always in these graphics, top right is good. These are the stars. You learn a lot and you make a lot of money. This is where we all aim for. And I now have the theory that we can do this by working with our clients and challenging them and saying, are you sure you want to do this boring stuff over again? Let's really look at what you need right now, what your brand needs, what your product needs. Let's do something together that is daring. And if you have this um, relationship of trust, then sometimes you can really engage your client and go there. Yeah, and this here, bread without butter, this is no one needs that. Don't do it. If you can avoid it, just get rid of it. This is no good. Not for your client, not for you. Create something meaningful. And here again, I think, not only look for what's good for your client, because we, try, we tend to do this, we look at this thing, the user needs. This is our basic training. This is where we all focus on user needs. And then, of course, we have the client needs, which is just a business reality. The client needs stuff, so we do it. But we should never forget our own needs. And I think we should work like this. And we should be like right there in the middle where these needs overlap. And then it's very interesting and it's very cool. And if it's not there, then you might question yourself, why did I do it anyway? So stop the engagement if you think your, main, your work is meaningless. I really mean it. Stop it. And we should all cut the crap. And no one needs diet water, so we don't have to pretend or make pretend, but we should get real. And I think we should get real about people, should get real about budgets, should get real about timelines, should get real about money, and this will in the end help everyone. So, finally, an important message is that I think we all should have fun working. And I will not say that if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong, but I really want to say if you're having fun, then you're doing something right. Thank you. Selfie with me. Yeah, sure. Oh, come on. Let's have Where a selfie. Where is my? Oh, it's beautiful. Hurry up. And oh, with the audience. Six also. minutes over the time. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's call Pavlos. Pavlos Tadzi Grigoriu. He's the moderator for uh, the Q&A uh, session. His partner from Proplas Architectonis. You have only 15 minutes. Okay, yes. no, no selfies. Sorry, I was <laughs> now we can see there. <laughs> okay. yeah. Maybe here. So, first of all, Robert, it was uh, really impressive, very interesting, very joyful. <laughs> I think. Thank you for the correct uh, time. Um, I really loved the project with the train, the Dutch uh, project. And I think that the Queen of Holland is uh, very lucky now that she has these uh, trains yeah. and uh, this information. And, uh, well, you know that there is a stereotype. You are German. And good for you. And <laughs> I'm 25% German, so you are safe with me. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have this stereotype that uh, we Greek, we are the joyful, the happy people, and the party, all party people. And uh, when you go up North Europe, you're not very joyful and uh, you're workaholic. That's and, a misunderstanding. Uh, yes, it's exactly. a misconception. Exactly. Yeah. So we just saw this and it's uh, very interesting that we saw this. And I wanted to ask uh, what your company is doing to keep uh, all these 100 employees or 99 employees because Spiros is Greek and he's <laughs> genuinely happy. So what about the other 99 employees? So what are you really doing? We just saw a couple of pictures, but yeah. do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, well, I think it is super important in, um, in, in the work environment, and this is 
if you are working in a company as well as if you're working as a freelancer, to have an environment that is inspirational, where you can, where you can grow in a professional sense, in a personal sense. So what we do, we have um, a, an internal presentation format that is every Thursday morning there is a 30-minute presentation. Someone from the outside comes in, gives a 30-minute talk, just like that. And this is every Thursday. And after that, we have breakfast together. So this is just one of the things um, then we do. Um, we have um, a lab Friday, where the second half of each Friday is just for lab work, where people do whatever they want to work on. Um, and we also have things like a uh, hackathon, which is new. We call it a maker day, because not only people who can code um, can participate, but everyone really makes something and creates stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you gave us a lot of tips, and we are going to copy or steal <laughs> some of these tips, especially how you organize the projects. But uh, still, uh, I think uh, you are a very good boss. <laughs> I, mean, I might say something like that. But if you are in, in this difficult period of crisis, especially in Greece, but also the rest of Europe, you also experience in crisis, uh, I, it's very difficult to find a job. And now we are talking about how to be happy when yeah. you are a designer, because you don't design only to make people happy, but you have to be also happy. Yeah, yeah. So I think in a very aggressive uh, working environment, it's very difficult, it's a yeah. challenge. Uh, absolutely, it is difficult. <laughs> it is absolutely difficult. I think in a, in a very um, challenging environment um, where there's a lot of stress and tension, it is very important to get an idea of where this um, stress and tension comes from. Because um, sometimes um, a solution can be found that is much less stressful and must much more um, easy to create once you have the mindset. And this is why I believe so strongly in getting on one line with the customer. You see, sometimes there's the situation where you see, oh, our, our um, client is just stupid. He does not get it. And I don't think that exists. I think there is no such thing as a stupid client. It's just trying to understand what this client is about. Because everyone has, has their own reality and they act according to their reality. And when you understand what makes your client tick, then you can actually understand how you can help him. Okay. Um, can, uh, can I take you to a different... Uh, because we don't have a lot of time, so <laughs> I, I have to go to a different part of the conversation. Um, as I told you before, I'm a city planner, so this is why I loved the train project. Yeah. Uh, and we, when we design for cities and for open spaces, we are forced or pushed really hard to adapt technology. And uh, because everybody, especially the local government and the municipalities, they love the smart city design, yeah. smart uh, software, mm -hmm. some smart applications yeah. and everything. But in the last couple of years, at least, I think that a lot of companies that they are not working like your companies, they don't have these success stories behind them, success projects, uh, they, we, we are developing a lot of uh, smart garbage, let me say something <laughs> yeah. like that. I mean, yeah. We are adapting technology and mm -hmm. then we, people, they're not really using all these mm -hmm. applications, they, they don't need them. Maybe are we inventing needs in order to sell something? Do yeah. you feel like that? I think if we do that, then we fail. If we invent needs, um, this, this will not um, uh, stick. I think it, it, um, this is why I said um, the services will fail if no one needs them. And sometimes you see this a big new service or a brand or something hits the market, but in the end turns out nobody needs it. Yeah. So there are famous examples of new products or new models of stuff that have come out and that have been a big failure because people don't pick it up. And I think in this sense, in all this um, also this data infrastructure that we walk around in modern cities today, if we can't find um, the points that really add value to the end user, um, then it will not um, stick. So I think it's not possible to invent a user need. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, there are applications that are failing, as you said. Mm. So at the same, I, I think that we are, uh, we see the same thing in uh, other uh, parts in our life. Mm. For example, the last couple of years, again, we see that there is a step back mm. in uh, high-tech uh, yeah. solutions. And people, uh, they try to filter, especially their personal yeah. data and their privacy. They don't like that somebody knows what kind, how many 
uh, what kind of temperature they like in their house, <laughs> or uh, if they, yeah. what time they are cooking yeah. their food, and what time they go home and to open yeah. the door. So maybe they, they don't know how to filter all this technology, and yeah. they just uh, become technophobic and uh, yeah. just step back and they say, I don't need any more technology. Yeah, I can I absolutely agree. I think we will see this a lot, that people um, um, get an attitude where they say, this is all too much for me. Please, do it without me. I'm off Facebook, I'm off Twitter, um, I don't need a smart home, I just want to, you know, the basic stuff. And I think there will be a bigger and bigger movement in that direction. But at the same time, um, on the other side, in the other parts of the population, there will be a content um, surge into analyzing everything what we do and deriving in the end value out of it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, with this, um, when the tracking devices came out with you, when you went jogging and you saw, hey, it's all these steps that I, all these calories that I burned, this is super cool. But then it loses its appeal. And then only if there's something else that comes on top of it that really adds value, you will pick it up again. But just as a novelty or as a fun thing, it wears off. Exactly. So maybe we should ask the audience. I have a couple of more questions, but maybe we should ask the audience first. I don't want to monopolize the talking. We have at least two questions. Hello, my name is George Yanikopoulos, I'm an industrial designer. I would like to ask what, uh, uh, if you have ever uh, find a difficult, difficult task like having a, a bad client with, not bad client, but a client that has a very bad brand, with bra uh, bad organization and a problematic product uh, or a problematic service, how would you deal with this? What could be the first in your list to solve it? Um, we would always try to understand the reality of the client and try to get an idea of what is happening, what is not working. And then we do it in, in, in workshops where we talk with the client and find out, not only with talking but also with methods, where we create something together to find out um, what, the, you know, um, what the actual pain is. And then it really depends whether it is something that we can solve. Sometimes it's just that we see with this amount of fear and agony in your organization, your service will never be successful. You, you, what you need is cultural change. And then if it's possible, we help them. And otherwise we say, um, you know, no use creating this if you can't fix that. Are there any more questions? Two more. Hello, uh, my name is Katerina Camprani and I have this question for you. Um, I have noticed that uh, in your office you prefer the physical contact uh, than the digital. Like, let's say you use the wall instead of Basecamp. You actually had like cl uh, cut paper A4 from printouts and put it on board. Um, but you design digital projects. Yes. Uh, have you ever suggested to a client that they would use some physical connection with their clients rather than do a digital, uh, an app. Let's say uh, for the app that says, uh, if you have time to go to the toilet, uh, <laughs> like ask someone, yeah. like, do I, like a staff, mm. do I have yeah. time to go to the toilet before? Yeah. Like, uh, get contact in the real world. Yeah, there's two parts that yeah. uh, I want to answer. The first one is, um, if I left the impression that we do the, the, the physical stuff instead of the digital, that was wrong. We all, of course, we use Basecamp, we all use all sorts of tools, digital tools, in parallel. Mm -hmm. But um, the physical thing has the big benefit of the whole team standing around it and working on it at the same time, which is the most immediate flow of information that we have found so far. And to the second part, yes, we have suggested this several times with our clients. And it's also super interesting when you talk about it because then um, there's often the, the discussion where the client says, ah, but we can't afford that, this is impossible. Mm -hmm. And when the, this is a very interesting dis discussion to have when the client says it's impossible, we can't do this, because then you can ask why. Yeah. And sometimes it is possible after all. It would be great to see a project that, that, that has come real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Next time. <laughs> there is another one. Hi. 
Um, first of all, exceptional presentation, uh, great work, great insight. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yeah, as a UX designer, uh, I couldn't not notice that um, you had some amazing workflows on the, your studio or agency or whatever. And I wanted to ask, how did you end up with those workflows? First question. And the second, what kind of designers you have there? Like, because UX designers, it, it's, a, it's a buzzword. UX yeah. design is a very, it's a mm. big buzzword yeah. right now. And um, there are not so many schools or whatever, institutions that teach pure 100% UX like yeah. what I saw mm. right then. Yeah. So that's the question. Yeah, um, uh, to, answer the, to answer the first question, we came up with these techniques. First of all, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, okay. <laughs> I've seen you. Uh, but I was thinking, so I was looking. Um, um, we came up with these um, methods, or we, uh, we found these methods, because it was the hard way. We did projects that failed, and projects where everyone was miserable, and projects where we said, oh, they can't believe how stupid this client is calling me again about this shit, and now he wants it green. And we always thought that there has to be a better way. And when Agile came up, you know, Agile methods from software development like Scrum, we work a lot with Scrum, then we, we, we said we have to try this because this is a different approach. And from that moment on, we, 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 we worked with it and we saw this is much better. And this is just how we came to it, by making mistakes and learning and... Having, okay. bad, having a bad time. <laughs> because also uh, many affinity mapping yeah. and, you know, yeah. and Scrum is uh, very hot right now. Anyway, and the second question, what kind of designers do you have? Yeah, there? exactly. Um, you, you know, it's very interesting. I personally, me personally, not reflecting um, our company, but just me, um, I'm a big, um, very skeptical about the acad academic um, teaching um, in our trade. Because I think um, most schools and most um, academic um, institutions are behind, behind the time and behind the pulse of what's going on. And I think you can learn the most on your own, on the web, with peers. And I, we, I, we noticed that a lot of people that come to our company come from a different background. They did something else before and then they got interested and then they got hooked. And then they find us and they come to us and they join us. But when we, when we hire people, we never look at their grades or at their um, education or what courses or whether they have um, a bachelor or master degree or what. We only look at what have you done, what is your experience, and what kind of a person are you? Would I want to go a weekend skiing with you? Okay, because you can read uh, like five blogs or uh, something, I don't know, and claim to be a UX designer, but what I saw was pure UX design, so I was wondering, because I come from an industrial design school yeah, yeah. that yeah. focuses on user-centered yeah. design and UX. Oh, yeah. Okay, I gave the complicated answer. The, the, the easy answer would be we are looking specifically for UX people, for visual designers, for coders that have an affinity to graphic design, um, for d developers, you know, that really yeah. think about the visual aspect as well, and designers that love to code as well. Yeah, this and is, uh, the user-centered design as a mindset. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there any more questions? We have a lot of questions. <laughs> Hello. Uh, here. Where? Over here. Where? It's, it's, it's the oh, Greek. Oh, yeah. oh over yeah. there. It's okay. the Greek sound. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I've seen that you've done a lot of city branding and for Amsterdam as well. Yes. Well, what's the difference of working for a client and compared to a city? Because uh, it's, say you work for Amsterdam, it's not like your office in Amsterdam is going to do something for one client in Amsterdam, but mm. you're going to do for the whole city. Yeah. So it, it has to apply to everything. Yeah. What are the challenges and how do you approach a brief and like that? Yeah. Well, you know, most clients have a, a lot of different clients from different industries have different um, settings. And oftentimes, also with big corporate clients, um, um, as well as clients in the public sector, we have to understand their universe, because sometimes their gravity is not our gravity, and their idea of time is not our idea of time. So, especially in the public sector, things you need to have a long breath. 
things take just a very long time. But this is fine. In the end, it comes down to also their understanding why you actually have the, um, uh, the, the, the task, why you see something as a problem, and why you think that this might be a solution to this problem. And then you, you, you take it from there. So in, in, when you work for a city, it's really about what does the city want to achieve? What is the goal? What is the meaning of this project? How could we measure whether we were successful? And then we take it from there. Thank you. Um, hello, here. Ah. <laughs> uh, talking about clients and referring to the slide with the three circles you had. Yeah. Um, sometimes we put our needs first and not the clients because we want to improve ourselves and be better in general, but. Sometimes also we put, um, we give greater priority to client needs, so maybe they will appreciate our, our work more. Um, so how do we find the balance between these two? Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's difficult. It is a, depends so much on the situation. Um, it's a, uh, as you say, it's a very difficult thing. I just know that if you find it, if you find something that is great for your client, great for your client's customers and great for yourself, this is the golden project. This is what you should aim for. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello. Me. Ah, okay. Uh, can you please give us again the slide with the uh, Greek words? I want to take a photo. Yeah, can I? I don't know whether I can. I would love to, but that. let's check with the iPad. The, the production should do that. Was there something wrong there? No, I don't. I think I can't. That's, I mean, I would love to, but <laughs> technology. Yeah, it's the next presentation. So. Oh, yeah, no. Okay. Um, Unfortunately. Do you reject clients? And if you say yes or something like this, uh, does it make your company unattractive to someone? Unattractive to someone? Uh, if you reject a client, yes. you said uh, a boring client? No. We don't no, I, I understand what you want to say. Are we unattractive if we say no? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, if, a, a client, uh, if a client want to come with, to you and you reject him, yeah. this uh, will make uh, him uh, Angry, <laughs> frustrated, uh, sad. This makes your company look bad. For no, the yeah, other yeah, yeah. No, and to the opposite. I think it's very good rejecting a client at the, at the beginning. When you see that this will never be a fruitful relationship, then you should end it. And I think in the end, it's much more attractive because then what you produce and the work you are associated with is much more interesting. So I think your attractiveness goes up if you say no to the projects that are not good for you or for your client. Okay, thank you. Hello. Up here. here. Where? Oh, there. Yeah. How did you convince your clients to change from the waterfall model <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to the kind of model yeah. that you are working, to get them so involved in the whole process rather than this is what I need, let me know when it's done? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, we need to talk a lot. <laughs> especially in the beginning. Um, but then it's also it's a matter of culture and it's a matter of trying to convince why we believe so strongly. And the longer we work with this me method, the more success stories we have to tell. And that might get our clients so far to say, okay, let's do it. And you know, I have observed we have different kinds of clients. Some clients, they want to work in an agile way because they know it and they have read about it or they already have practiced it and they believe in it and this is perfect. Or you have the clients that say, you know, nothing, I don't care, I'm so desperate, I just need something to do. If you think this is the thing, then just do it, because this is our last resort. And then we work with them and it's very good and then they're very happy. Um, and then we have the clients who are super skeptical and then we have to work a lot with them and try to convince them that they give up the so-called control of the waterfall. But in the end, planning is just guessing. You can write a fantastic plan. There was, I know there were fantastic ISO certified project management plans to build our airport in Berlin. It does not help. In the end, it's just a plan. Or there's something about the subway in Thessaloniki, I heard. 
you know, plans. <laughs> <laughs> and then, if, then we try to convince them. And, and, and then most, mostly we have the experience, once we get started, they roll with it, and then it's good. Well, don't laugh, Robert, because it's your money for the same. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a follow-up on that. Uh, the, do you think that the scale of your company matters when you're trying to work like that, or could it be done by a two-person studio as well? In a two-person studio would be hard pushed because um, we work in multidisciplinary teams, and typically a team is like what you saw four to six people. And then you need to have designers, um, visual designers, you have to have a creative lead, you have to have one or two front-end developers, maybe a back-end developer. And we work with these multidisciplinary teams, and they work in Scrum, which means without a project manager, but in a self-organized matter, accompanied by a Scrum master. So you have a team of, I think, five to seven people that would be the minimum to work like that. Thank you very much. No more questions. Do we have time? Now you decide. I think we will take two questions. Are we okay with the time? We have okay, three. Okay. Yes, we are okay? Okay, we'll take three questions. All right. Um, uh, regarding experience design and service design, we could say that those are, uh, uh, are not so tangible, like product or graphic design or packaging. How do you uh, uh, know that uh, the result will be successful? Do you have any... Uh, any tools to work with. Yeah, absolutely, and it is crucial to measure your result. So oftentimes you have strategies that are longer than a Big Bang launch, that are like incremental launches, and then along the way we can measure and inspect and adopt. Um, uh, but it is very important to define in the beginning with your client how success would look like, and then to measure whether you have achieved it or not. Another question? Hello. Uh, Hello. With that method that you have, talking with the client and have all this uh, collaboration, uh, do they come over again to you if they want a new product or something new? Or they just uh, say, oh, these people are too tiring, I'll go to another office. <laughs> the, the job is done quickly. Um, the first. Any more questions? <laughs> A lot of questions. Yeah, but it's, you know what? It's so right. It is tiring. Yeah, you're right. It is tiring. Okay, hello. Um, yeah. I would like to ask you regarding your design process. Oh, here yeah. I am. Yeah. Okay. One of the most important things from um, working on a, on a project. Uh, in the design process is a collaboration and the co-creation with the clients. And this is what I would like to ask you is, how does your client understand the value of, the, of this collaboration and co-creation? And how, how you will manage to put your clients in this design process to, to collaborate with you? Um, well, we have to educate the client, really, and to explain the role and to accompany him. We always strive to have, um, if you're familiar with Scrum, then you maybe you know the role of product owner. Mm -hmm. And this role, we always aim to um, have the client have a person who is the product owner. And sometimes if the client is unexperienced in this way of working, then we have an internal product owner that helps him to, you know, to get better in this role and to understand what are the priorities and how to be um, a valuable product owner for the team. Because from my experience, the most of them, they don't understand actually the value. The most of them think that it's something like it's a waste of time. <laughs> so they don't want to be part of the whole design yeah. process. And this is where you should say, well, then it will not work. If you think your time is too valuable, then how do you um, think this project is ever going to be done? Yeah. Any more questions? So maybe I can ask the final uh, one. But I don't know, I was backstage, maybe you said something about it, but I read in the internet that your company doesn't participate in creative pitches. Yeah. So why are you doing that? And uh, I mean... Mm -hmm. 
It was uh, the beginning of the company was mm. like that, or mm. during uh, the development of the company you decided about that? Yeah, yeah. We, we do not participate in creative pitches, um, and we decided that also after having the bad experience of being in several or in long history of participating in creative pitches, and in the end, it's a waste of everybody's time and money. And it's also a guessing game, because if you engage in a creative pitch, you get a briefing, and then you work on it, but it's just, you know, you have never talked with the client, there's only the briefing, so you think you make up all this, it's only assumptions. You only work on assumptions, and then you are, if you are lucky, the client likes it. But liking it is just, I like the color. And this is a really bad and stupid way of working, and we... This is why we gave it up. Okay. Yeah. okay, Robert, I think if there are no more questions, we don't have any questions from Twitter. Or no? Okay. Then uh, who's going to win the Oscar for the best movie this year? <laughs> <laughs> you love movies. It's good, it's good that you ask me. I don't know about this year. I don't know about the Oscars. But best movie of last year was Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.